From Chicago's CAN TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Hello and welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Bruce Dumont sitting in today for Ken Davis. Did we just experience a red wave, a blue wave, a purple wave? Today we'll figure the whys and wherefores of Tuesday's midterm election. We'll also parse President Trump's firing of his Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. Was it a post-election surprise from the president? Joining me are two veteran familiar faces on the Chicago media scene. Del Marie Cobb has decades of political consulting experience for candidates at all levels, including a stint as Illinois spokesperson for presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. She is now president and founder of her own political and media consulting firm, The Publicity Works. And Ray Hanania joins us, who's done it all and more. He was a fixture in and around the halls of power in Chicagoland and beyond as a political reporter, finally as head city hall reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times. Now he heads his own public relations firm from Urban's called Urban Strategies Group. He's also a stand-up comedian. So uh, was there anything to laugh about on uh, election night from, from a comedic standpoint? Just that everybody took the results serious other than that. You know. <laughs> Well, I want to talk about, uh, obviously, we're going to divide it into a variety of areas this evening, but I want to talk about the, the changes in the Illinois con uh, congressional delegation. The Democrats, uh, they were looking for 30, they were actually, they, were, they needed 23 seats, but there were 39 seats that were viewed as toss-ups by the national uh, political uh, experts, and uh, three of those uh, ended up in Illinois. One, obviously, is... Uh, uh, Lauren Underwood, I think that was probably the biggest surprise. Uh, Chewy Garcia will go to uh, Washington. And again, uh, we have Sean Caston uh, going and replacing uh, Peter Roscom. Uh, was, was Lauren Underwood the big surprise of the night? Was that the sleeper uh, in your view, Del Marie? Well, I don't know if it was sleep the sleeper in terms of people ac who actually s were supporting her. Uh, she was on my radar at, at the primary. Uh, somebody brought her to my attention during the primary and then, of course, at that time, I thought she was a long shot, but once she beat out six white men in a 80% white majority suburb, I thought she really had a chance of winning. And the party didn't even pay attention to her until afterwards. She had hardly any money during the primary. It was all gra grits and grassroots. But then uh, after the primary and the general, she started, she had a million dollar uh, peak, then she had a $2 million peak over the summer, and then she went to $3 million. She has seven um, uh, offices throughout the district. Ray, was this an example where, where the Congressman Hulkman was basically asleep at the switch? He didn't, he didn't give much uh, credibility to the competition? I think everybody took it for granted that Roskam and Hulkman were going to do well. Um, yeah. It's hard to believe that uh, so many Republicans in Illinois would lose so easily. But, I, you know, I think when you look at, you know, this whole concept of election is run by the top of the ticket. And in a sense, J.B. Pritzker was the top of the ticket, and he blew the doors off the Republican Party. And I think that spread and helped out a lot of people. And uh, I think, the, you know, the fact that uh, Trump really never came into Illinois in any big way. Downstate. He's, yeah, he's downstate, I, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, in, in where it mattered, up in the north, where he needed to help some Republicans. He never did anything up there. and uh, was. But, he's, a, but he said that Peter Roskam, he, he singled out Peter Roskam as he didn't want his help. And, 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 he, and he lost the seat. Right. Well, but also, I'm, he I'm didn't not, want it. I'm not so it sure that it would have helped him in Chicago. It wouldn't have helped him, and it wouldn't have helped him, and it wouldn't have helped Hulkron. Uh, not, in, yeah. not in this area. Yeah. Nobody would have predicted that if, if eight months ago that Ros that uh, uh, Hulkron or Roskam would lose the election. Nobody would have predicted that. Nobody would have said that would have happened. Well, well I, I don't certainly think, thought it was going to happen yeah. after the primary for for. I would Underwood. hope so. You were working with. No, no, uh, I wasn't with working Underwood. with her. No, she was well, not. You supported no, her. I supported her after she was on my radar. I mean, I didn't know anything about her like anyone else yeah. until I learned so, about her after the primary. But Ro Roskam was a target uh, from the get go, and so uh, because of the the issue of whether or not suburban uh, Republicans, primarily suburban Republican women, are turned off by Donald Trump, are they going to be turned off by anyone that's associated with Donald? Trump mean are they a Republican? I mean, I think that was part of Peter Roskam's problem because when the president went uh, down south, I mean, he went down there. He mentioned Mike Bost. He mentioned Rodney Davis, and they both won. But so he, you know, other, but, because that was that's that's downstate central Illinois where the president is popular. But the other thing for for Lauren Underwood, she out of the 
right out the box and this was intuitive she realized the health care was the biggest issue and having a being a nurse and then having a preexisting condition herself she immediately framed that nobody framed that for her and she saw that that was a winning message and that's what helped her right i think women voters um, and when we get a chance to really deep, dig deep into the voter turnout and the voting patterns I think we're going to see that women really kind of were the decisive factor in Illinois. Absolutely. The weakness of the Re Republican Party in Illinois. Um, regardless of what happened nationally, I think that the Republican Party in Illinois is very weak. Oh, it, 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 it's, it's almost non-existent. <laughs> I mean, every state constitutional office is now held by a Democrat. Uh, you've got the same thing at the county, uh, at least in the county of it's Cook. Almost and it, 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 it's, it's almost erased. It's almost erased. Is that as a as a partisan Democrat, Del Marie? Do you think that's good? Well, I don't know if it's good or not. I mean, I do believe there should be checks and balances all the time, uh, whenever possible. But if certain, certainly, as a Democrat, I can't uh, be upset about it. Um, you know, we're going to, this is a chance to see what really can happen and hopefully we can get past petty politics and really get some things done because at this point, the way the, the city and well, the state. Well, who's practicing petty politics? Oh, it's been. Isn't that bipartisan? No, it hasn't been bi bipartisan. It's been democratic uh, petty politics, which okay. is why we are in some of the trouble <laughs> we're in. And, uh, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying that the Democrats are free of that. And you know me, Bruce, I, I speak the truth. And you I'm do. not saying that we're free of that. What I'm saying is, hopefully, with some new people in there, new Democrats in there, new blood in there, that we will see some changes. Because the city is going to hell, I mean, the city and the state are going to hell in a handbasket. And we do need some people who will step up and do some things free of petty politics. Well, you had said that we will see what happens now with uh, uh, this Democratic surge. But we literally did see what happened in the third congressional district where a Nazi candidate, someone who was a former member of the National Socialist Party, was able to get on the ballot as a Republican and get 55,000 votes. How does a Nazi get, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? I think not having a two-party system is are what allows... Sure was that, are you sure it's that many? 55,000. 55,000 55, votes in the third district for Congress. How does that happen? In America, it's just unbelievable. But also, that's probably in some regard a protest vote as well. Well, I, when it I was talking, wasn't talk just people supporting the Nazi a Nazi candidate, but it was about not supporting Lipinski. Remember that when when we talk <laughs> about why I voted for Trump, okay? Because people are very angry with me for abandoning, you know, after Bernie Sanders and voting for him. But um, that's what happens when you don't have two parties, and that's where we're headed. And I but think again, that's a big I think the key thing in Illinois at the moment is we are sending three new members of Congress. Uh, one Hispanic, Chewy Garcia, uh, one uh, a white male, Sean Caston, and one an African-American woman, uh, Lauren Underwood. And so we're going to have three people that went there. And I would say that, that, that they, they will all be challenged because of the closeness of the race. Those, those districts will be viewed as, as tough districts in 2020. But again, this is, this is a rather significant uh, you know, uh, you know, change in, in the makeup, uh, no pun intended, of uh, who represents us in, in Washington, D.C. And again, they're now going in, and they will, they will have a speaker. They'll be in the majority, and they will, uh, they will, one of their first votes is obviously is going to be whether or not uh, they're going to vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker. It, it, in your view, uh, and you, again, you're, you're a pro's pro, Del Marie. Is, is Nancy Pelosi the best choice for speaker right now? Well, I don't know if, uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything against her. That's the decision they're going to have to make. But the one thing I can say is we do know that she, she knows her stuff and she knows how to work the, the system in terms of making sure that her people get what they need. And, uh, and if you've got a, a, a whole class of new people, freshmen, congressmen, coming into the Congress, then you're going to need somebody who is well-seasoned and is a veteran. Uh, Ray, what do you think of that? I, I'd like to see somebody get in there and try to bring the level of uh, uh, argument down and focus on what we need. And it's not going to come by defeating the other side or suppressing voices. It's going to come by trying to find ways to work together on certain issues. I think Nancy can do that, and that's what I'm hopeful for. 
No, I, I would say at the moment is that I think she probably, because there are so many new people coming in, and by the way, many of those new people are coming in, uh, several of them have said that they will vote against Nancy Pelosi. But again, I think that she's being criticized. Primarily, it's a generational issue. But the point is, you have to, know, you have, to have someone that knows the ropes. Exactly. And I don't know who else in that group knows, knows the ropes. I mean, there's going to be a challenge of Steny Hoyer, uh, who I think uh, other members of the leadership, but also uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, whether you like her or, or hate her, she's one, of the sh she's one of the sharpest political operatives in the House. And that's what a lot of young people don't understand, right. is that you can't have all new people who are all learning how, you know, where the keys to the bathroom are at the same time. That's why when uh, Barack Obama became president, uh, many young people were upset because he went back and got some of the Clinton people to uh, help him. But mm -hmm. the Clintons have been the last Democrats in the White House. So who else were you going to get? Right. Well, it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge. And the other, the other part of it is, as you, as you look ahead, I mean, the president basically said the other day that, uh, you know, he, he was fine with the results. He thought it was almost a, a victory. He made the point that maybe getting along with the Democrats will be easier for him than getting along with the Republicans because it's uh, so uh, challenged at the top. And uh, you're a supporter of, of the president. Um, did the news of last Tuesday, did that make you more confident or less confident that President Trump can be reelected in 2020? You know what? I, I, it's not, I don't think it's about Trump, and I don't even think he was elected because it was about Trump. I think he was elected because people were unhappy with the choices. And as long as Trump appears to be the only choice for a lot of people, um, I think he does have a chance of being reelected. I think this midterm election was predictable. Who, I mean, I don't know how, we can go back to the 60s, and I think there were only two midterms where it didn't happen, but every uh, party out of the White House ends up making significant grounds. I'm not sure that the Democrats made significant ground, you know, picked up significant it number of seats. It was definitely not a wave. No, it wasn't. And, and but the media, I, you know what this, I, I am a critic of the news media. I think they lift up your expectations and good things suddenly don't look that good sometimes. This was not a, the major wave that they predicted, but they were smart this time. They didn't give us all the polling that I think they wanted to tell us that this was gonna be a sweep. It wasn't a sweep. They took the House, that's great, it's good for the country, but they failed in the Senate the, because of Trump. He focused on the, on the Senate, and I think the Democrats recognized that's where the war was going to be. They spent more money fighting in the Senate than, than they spent in the House. And maybe that's one reason why they didn't get more seats in the House. I think one of the other things is that as you, as you look at, uh, especially an important part of the Republican base, are uh, evangelical Christians. And thus far, the president has made two appointments to the Supreme Court. The key to making appointments to the Supreme Court, as we know, is the votes that you can count on your side in the Senate. So I think for the next two years, if any other Supreme Court justice comes forward, or um, uh, the, the, uh, McConnell has already said they're going to focus on judges, on all the federal judges that are out there. I mean, this is a much stronger Republican club in the Senate for the president uh, now or in January than it was two months ago. I mean, frankly, in many cases, they don't have to worry about what Susan Collins and what uh, Lisa Murkowski might do because they're more of a of moderate more to liberal world. Republicans because they, they've been wiped out. Marsha Blackburn will take, she'll take that, that, that vote in a different way, it, as will, as will uh, uh, Mr. Braun in Indiana. If I were a, re a Republican voter, or if I were a Democratic voter, solid Democrat, I would have wanted not to have won the House and allowed this rancor to continue for another two years. And I would say that had this gone on like this, the way the first two years have gone, I would say Trump would be in trouble. But I think that the Democrats have really done themselves a, an ironic disservice. They're going to moderate Trump. You could tell already after the election he was a, far less um, belligerent in his comments, except, of course, at the, the news media. Conference. <laughs> except at the news conference, but, where he but, continued to lie. 
But reaching out to Nancy Pelosi, you know, talking, I, I thought he was far less belligerent than what I expected from him. And I think he realizes that he needs to do something if he's going to get reelected. So I think that may help tone well, him d down I, a little bit. I disagree. I think that all these races in the House energize people. And uh, because, you know, you have one of the largest turnouts in midterm than you've Ever. had. And so mm -hmm. this is something that's important because people need to see that not only they can be energized in the midterm, one of the things I've been saying since 2016 was that Democrats vote every four years and Republicans vote every two years, which is how Republicans incrementally took every uh, body of government away from us. And so if we were going to start getting it back, we had to start getting involved in the midterms. And so you saw that. Uh, minority voting was still not at, at where it should have been here in Chicago, but the fact that you start seeing progress, you know that that energizes people, and so the next election is a, primate, a presidential election, and I don't see uh, Trump getting it any better. I mean, we saw him yesterday lying to, to uh, the media, saying that he, his ratings are the highest that, of any president for African Americans. His ratings are at 8%. That's the highest of anybody else mm -hmm. in the African-American community. I mean, he's just one lie after the, the other. And I guess if you have no morality, I guess the best thing to do is put people on the Supreme Court who do have morality. So, if it, so I mean, it's a whole uh, a myri myriad of things to make sure that he's not going to be reelected. But, but again, for the next two years, the, the conservative, part of the conservative base, the evangelical base, the primary thing for them is is the Supreme Court. Now, maybe because they now have two on the Supreme Court, they don't want they don't need three or four. But again, if those openings come up, I'm just saying is the president of the United States for the next two years is going to be in a much better position to deliver for the evangelicals because he's going to be able to get his selections through the Senate because they picked up uh, three seats. And he may be able to do that. And if, if another opening happens, let's hope it doesn't. But if another one does, he, he will be able to do that. But that will only energize the Democratic base. Well, it will energize the Republican base as well. Well, it will energize well, us and, even more. And the, and the Republicans <laughs> and the conservative, and I hate to talk about Republicans and Democrats anymore because uh, Trump's base isn't all Republican. They didn't even like him when he ran, you know, in, in the primary. Um, his base, it consists of a lot of centrist and conservative Democrats um, who are just tired of the Democratic Party doing a lot of things, saying one thing and doing something else. Uh, if we weren't tired of that, Hillary Clinton would have been president today, but I think that people looked at her and said she's no different than the problems that we've had in the past. Um, I, what I see happening is um, I see the Democrats taking their power. Now, they can go one of two ways. They can try and show that they still want to do the good things for the country, or they can initiate impeachment hearings. They can initiate subpoenas and investigations. And I think that's going to energize Trump's base and Democrats who are centrists or conservatives, if you want to call them, who are not going to be happy with that, you know, direction. Well, I disagree well, with that because... Um, well, do you, I mean, do, you, do, you, do you want all investigations and all... I don't, I mean, I want things to get done, but the bottom line is the gauntlet has been thrown. I mean, uh, Trump said yesterday, okay, if you want to do that, then we'll do that. Uh, if you investigate me as if there's not something to investigate, yeah. because there is, so if you investigate me, then I'm going to go after you. So, I mean, he's the one who's throwing the gauntlet down. No, uh, I, I, I... We I, already I, are in the middle of an investigation. I th I so let the investigation Adam, come Adam, to an well, end. Credibility well, the, the, the question I, is the investigation may be coming uh, to an end sooner. And I think the question is, uh, do the people want additional investigations? I would say that if you're a Democrat, and at least other than investigations and impeachment, the Democrats have to have some issue to go back to the people that they lost in the election or inspire them to turn out. They've got to come up with some, someone else. I mean, I, I would say, and I'd like to get your appointment for this, I think that if you were to walk into the African-American communities of Chicago and you spend more time there than, than I do, Del Marie, I would be surprised if you told me that the, the family on the west side is concerned about impeachment, impeaching the president 
or investigating the president. No, I just not, don't believe they're that. They're not in, in that they are not consumed with that, but they weren't consumed with emails either. And 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 that seemed to be the only story that anybody was covering during the presidential right. election. So they weren't consumed with that either. They, they want were consumed bread and, with they jobs. Want, they exactly. Want, they want bread and butter issues. Exactly. And if the president can prove that the uh, that the employment is is improving for African Americans and others, if he can prove that, that's that's at least well, a positive I can, message. I can tell the you Democrats that's have not got happening. I, mean, I can tell you if you're talking about Chicago, which is what I know. Yeah. If you're talking about Chicago, that is not the case. So if everybody wants to say all, all of a sudden black people are working in Chicago, no, that is not well, the I case. I don't think anybody has said that. But, no, but, he but has, the president has said that. Well, he hasn't specifically said Yes, Chicago. he did. Yes, he did. At a news conference, he did. Well, then he has Especially to since he was talking about, remember, Chicago's he, on his radar. Oh, yeah, definitely <laughs> Chicago's on his radar. So he does talk about Chicago specifically. Well, you well, know, I when we look at the investigation, just to say something about Mueller, I mean, here, this guy's been going for two years now, and yes, he has convicted people, but how many of those people were directly involved or were convicted because of collusion with the Russians? That's the thing that bothers me. That was what the investigation was supposed to be about, but it feeds into this perception that it's just another political witch hunt, and if it continues that way, it's just going to help the president and make him stronger. I don't think it's going to hurt him. I want, to, I want to switch gears and come back to what's happening in the state of Illinois. As I mentioned, uh, we have an all, or we will have an all-democratic constitutional officers at the statewide level. It's a complete wipeout uh, of the Republicans. But uh, J.B. Pritzker, he spent $170 million of his own money to become governor of the state. He still has a lot left over. <laughs> How is he going to use the money left over to basically challenge Mike Madigan, who also has a large sum of money, not nowhere near what, what uh, Pritzker has? I think. But is that, isn't that going to be an ongoing battle as to who's going to control some Democratic votes? And is, is J.B. Pritzker going to be willing to put his own money where his mouth is? Because there will come a time, maybe sooner than later, where he and Speaker Madigan will disagree on an issue. This is where I, uh, I, I distinguish between national politics and local politics. Um, I think the big mistake of Republicans running in Illinois was to focus on Mike Madigan as the issue. The truth is... He was is, in every spot. <laughs> I, he was in every spot. And I'm going to tell you, I think that they missed the ball. I think there were a lot of issues they could have addressed. I don't think Mike Madigan is the problem. Mike Madigan just happens to be a good politician who knows how to run office, who knows how to build alliances, who knows how to win elections. And I think it was a major mistake that cost a lot of people on the Republican side their elections that they wanted. He was not the issue. They made him into the issue. Yeah, they took Rauner's lead. Yes, and but I think, and, yeah, and I think that's what hurt Rauner. Mm -hmm. So I think he had nothing going in except attacking Mike Madigan, and I'm thinking, okay, but what did you what do? Have you done? Give us a specific where you actually tried to do something and were stymied with a good something that would identify with us, and I didn't see that. All I saw him doing was beating up on Madigan, and everybody at every level followed that lead, and I think that's one reason why Democrats have tightened their grip on Illinois so tightly. I've never seen it this strong than it is today. And also, there isn't a Republican bench. You, you look at the Republican bench down the road, it's a very weak bench, whereas 15, 20, 25 years ago, when, when you were on the beat at the Sun-Times, I mean, there was, a, there was a vibrant Republican Party. We had Republicans in the, in the city council. That's right. You, know, you back almost in the, had in all the Republicans 70s. on the state. Yeah. At one point, I think we had all Republicans on well, the state. Well, when Roland Burris was uh, the comptroller, he was the only Democrat. Right. in the executive office right. so um and that's how you got the governors republican governors who won time after time but now we have a situation where the incumbent democrat he has so much money left over i mean it, it seems to me that that this uh statewide uh, control of the constitutional officers and the general assembly i mean you can't even see the end of that of that era. But see, this I is can't see the end of that era. How do you fight that era? Because already there's been one Republican who stepped forward, and that's Bruce Rauner. He spent well over a well over 150, probably 200 million between what he spent last time and this time. So he poured all of his own money in to build the Republican Party, and he ends up with nothing. But this was Rauner's legacy. He he did this. 
he said, I can buy the governor's seat. And so and he did. And, and exactly. And so the and Democrats so found, and so the Democrats said, well, we're going to find somebody too. If that's what it takes, right. you somebody being rich so they can pour all their own money into it, then okay, you've set the you've set the standard. So is Ken Griffin and, next? Well, let's hope <laughs> not. But that may be the case. I mean, you're looking at that's what you're looking at. You're looking at Michael Sachs, who might run for uh, mayor. Right. So that's what people are doing now. They're looking to see how much money do I have and how much money do I want to spend for this seat. I think you're going to see the Democratic Party split into two parties, um, one very liberal and one more conservative in Illinois. And I think that'll start playing out in uh, the Chicago election um, and in local races. I think that's the only uh, way to see the direction. But you know, it's really but fascinating. It, but that mirrors, the, that mirrors the split at the national level as well. So what you're saying is that the... the well, the national election yeah. did have an impact on us for sure. It did. I think if... <laughs> if uh, Trump were not president, I don't think that the Republic, I, it, that did hit play into the, uh, the d losses that the Republican Party had. But, you know, I got to go back to this one perception of Illinois that we've always had, that the Speaker of the House would, this belief that he really never wanted a Democratic governor. He always wanted a Republican governor sure. because having a Democratic governor now, the question is, how is that going to work out? with the Speaker of the House and a Democratic governor. That's what I think is going to be interesting. And I, and I, I have to tell you. But well, I'm going to ask you one follow-up. In, in that equation in the past, there's always been a strong Democratic or strong mayor of Chicago. In this particular case, looking at the field of 19 that's out there right now, do you see a strong person in that group that, that would match either a Rahm Emanuel or Richard M. Daly, or Richard J. Daly. No. Do you? No. I mean, I, don't I, I see good know. candidates. Yeah, but I was yeah. going to say the same thing. Yeah, but There's but some it, good candidates. It'll be a weak. It'll be more of a weaker Chicago mayor uh, and a stronger Democratic governor. But you know, but the other thing is still all roads lead to City Hall in Chicago, and it doesn't matter who the mayor is. I mean, of course, we want a mayor with some experience. But you know, when I when you when I was in Africa, people were saying Harold Washington. So, whoever the mayor is in Chicago is going to have some power. And but it's just getting there, getting through this process, and weeding out who has an opportunity, who's a viable candidate, and who isn't a viable candidate. You know, for a long time, um, Cook County, the uh, president of the Cook County Board the uh, uh, chairman of the Cook County Democratic Organization and the mayor of Chicago were very close and they controlled everything mm -hmm. in the state. And now that center fulcrum point is moved away from Cook County, away from Chicago, and it's gonna be interesting to see where it lands. May it, they're gonna bring it down state, I just mm -hmm. can't see that. Let's talk uh, a little bit about the mayor's race. We're, we're halfway through the show. We, we're getting to the race that everybody wants to talk about now. <laughs> Uh, and again, uh, Re State Representative Liam Ford uh, announced uh, earlier in the week. LaShawn. Uh, LaShawn, rather, mm -hmm. that uh, he also is throwing his hat in the, in the race. Uh, when you look at, at that huge field, many of that field, many in that field are African American. Give us your take as to how that shakes out. Well, I mean, it's certainly going to split the black vote. But we also, as I always say, you've got to get past the petition phase right. because 12,500 signatures is not easy uh, to get. And you know that you've got to get far more than 12,500 signatures to make it onto the ballot uh, because you've got to have good signatures. And those candidates with organizations are going to have their people out there combing through the petitions uh, to eliminate some of these people. And, and so, you know, the field in January is not going to look like the field today. We know that. Okay. And so that's, that, that, that's what I'm going to put my attention to, who's going to be weeded out. Yeah. Regarding petitions, uh, who can sign a petition? And can you sign more than one petition? No, you can't. You can. You cannot sign more than one petition, or I should say, you shouldn't sign more than one petition. People do sign multiple petitions all the time because they just think, "Oh, I want to help this person get on the ballot. Everybody should have an opportunity to run." But the problem with and that is, and the person is, soliciting uh, their signature is not going to volunteer <laughs> or ask the question if you've signed someone else's. You're not eligible to sign the one for right. me. 
because okay. they're just trying to get their petitions. Well, that, you know, that's a very important piece of yeah. information no, it for, is. Our, for our and viewers. You shouldn't, because you shouldn't sign a petition if you've already died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the problem is with signing multiple petitions is being the, the date that's it was notarized. So if you signed a petition today and then you sign a petition tomorrow for another candidate, but I know the one you signed today was notarized right. today, and that one is the one that counts. That's the one that the counts. The one that, that you sign tomorrow is not going to count. Who, who, who is looking up and matching all of these signatures? Candidates with organizations. Right, and they money. Have, they have people who are down at City Hall or they have the election software on their computers and they've got somebody that's doing nothing but that. And the software these days can, can pull out a, a duplicate? No, I mean, it's not necessarily that it's finding a duplicate, but you're, you're, you're literally looking through the candidates' uh, uh, petitions. And of course, the day, the day after they file, all the campaigns that, again, that have money, are going to get copies of their opponent's petitions so that they can really have a team that's doing nothing but going through those petitions with a fine tooth comb. Of the 19 that are running uh, with, the, with the addition of Representative Ford at this moment, how many of those 19 do you think will pass muster with their petitions? Probably five, a handful. Five? Yeah, some of them won't, you know, some of them they may not even challenge. Um, and they, they'll just sort of be hanging out there. Uh, no, they won't get any attention uh, anyway from the media. But I would say in terms of solid uh, signatures on the ballot, you might have five candidates at the end. Do you agree with that, Ray? I, I think it is going to come down to uh, the candidates who have the most money in organization because no matter how many people, I think every candidate can get 12,000 signatures but can they stay on the ballot and can they withstand a challenge? Because if I had the money, um, Tony Preckwinkle, uh, Susanna Mendoza, uh, I would challenge everybody that I thought was a threat to narrow the field because if I were African American, I'd only want a few black candidates, not a lot. Um, Mendoza, I think a Hispanic, even though the Hispanic vote is always traditionally lower than blacks or whites, um, one strong Hispanic could become one of the two top finalists because this is a race to see who's going to get that 18 percent of the vote you know the in this election because to it, get to the runoff the to, top two yeah because right. it's going to be a runoff so and, the, yes. so that's why you're looking at it in two phases i mean and i have done campaigns like this where i said okay we're not looking to win we're just looking to be the in the runoff and the hard, yeah. and and if we're in the runoff then we're going to win and right. the hardest part isn't going to be i think not getting the signatures it's going to be coming back once they've thrown you off <laughs> to get back on the ballot and to fight le a legal fight to stay on that ballot, I think we're going to see a lot of the and candidates And that's what they do off. is tie you up. Yes. That, that's the whole purpose of, of trying to tie you up. And there are people out here who have made it their business. Um, they are making money doing nothing but that, making mm -hmm. sure that they go through petitions and tie people up. Uh, if you were to uh, offer your opinion now, who do you think are the two most likely to end up in the runoff? I Ray? think I think Tony Preckwinkle and uh, Susanna Mendoza. That's hard to say. I, I I definitely think Tony Preckwinkle, but it's hard to say on the other end if it'll be Susanna Mendoza or or Gary Chico or it's hard to say or Bill Daly. Mm -hmm. Bill Daly. I if I were to you could you probably have to look at five people and then as you get closer to the election see where they play out because. Some candidates, I think Susanna Mendoza is going to be a weak candidate. I didn't like her victory speech when I was watching it. It seemed too mean. I didn't like her commercial. I think, you know, the, I think that she could sell herself as being tough. But what I'm saying is that as we get closer, that may change. But I think that they're among the top two. I think uh, Daly is one. I think Gary McCarthy, I think if he has a good uh, plan to... Uh, convey his ideas on uh, fighting crime. Um, he's the one with the most credentials who could sell that to the public. Can he actually do that? I'm not sure. So it isn't just who they are, it's do they have an organization that can reach out, get their message to people, and can they make that message uh, 
you know, work with but voters. But again, we, you know, you're talking about, you know, the African-American vote and where, and where those constituencies might end up. Again, you have African-American women, you have African-American men, you have younger African-American women, you have older African-American, you have, you have those that are married, those that are single. I mean, you've got, you've got a variety of ways. Uh, you have a gay and lesbian uh, or, or lesbian uh, candidate uh, in the race. So you've got, I mean, this thing is divvied up so many different ways. There's, it's, it's almost going to be impossible, I think, to figure out until, as you say, they cross this threshold of credibility that they're on the ballot, the signatures are there, they've been bona fide, they've demonstrated they have enough money to fight the ongoing battle of just, of just basically getting in the ring. And then, and then, same way on the other side. I mean, you have you have a variety of of uh, of, of, I don't of, think of white candidates, see... and and you also have, I think, with uh, Susanna Mendoza. I mean, granted, she is Hispanic, but G G Gary Chico is Hispanic. Although some people say, not really, but you know, he technically is. It's it's in, in the bloodstream. He'd be he would he would attract the white voters, I think, more than he would Hispanics. But and that's not to knock. Uh, you know, that's not to criticize all these candidates. I think they all come in with great things. But the one thing I can almost say for sure is we won't see two finalists from the same race. I think you're going to see right. two finalists who are of different races and different ethnicities. And, and I think that's what uh, will be the choices for voters. Well, and it'll be the, interesting. And one of the things that is happening, too, uh, that I've, I, you know, there's bubbling up, is the Latino community, they do want a... Latino mayor, mayor candidate. So they're clear about that. They wanted Jesus Garcia, and, and, and you know, and if Gary Chico is the only one, certainly they may galvanize around him, whereas in the past they haven't. Be and I saw some of that during the, just, uh, during the Attorney General's race, uh, when uh, Latino um, elected officials were supporting Jesse Ruiz. Jesse Ruiz is not a progressive by any means, but I saw many progressive Latinos supporting him, to my surprise, sure. because he was Latino. And so there, that's what's going on in the mayor's race. They're now saying they're exerting their power because they're not happy that there, there isn't a prominent Latino running because they wanted Jesus. And so now they would have gotten behind Gary Chico be because he's Latino, whereas normally they wouldn't have. And maybe if Susanna comes out, even though she's not traditionally a progressive either, they may get behind her if they think she might have a better chance than Gary Chico, only because of what you said in terms of but the white community. I, I think but Mike Madigan is going to also play a major uh, factor right. in who he backs for, for mayor, Not and it doesn't have to be up front or public, but who he supports, I think that candidate is going well, to be very be strong. That may be Susanna Mendoza. Who, who, that's what I think. Okay, that is what I, I think what we have here is also within the old guard Democratic uh, Party is you have, we haven't talked much about uh, where, where, the, where the tentacles of the, of the daily campaign comes from. It may be mostly LaSalle Street, but again, uh, certainly uh, if he splits a vote with anybody, I would think he'd be splitting the vote with the Gary McCarthy well, constituency. However, in the area of Mendoza and, and Gary Chico, Gary Chico has been endorsed by Ed Burke, and it may very well be that Ed Burke and Mike Madigan are on the different side because he, she, she may have the backing of Mike Madigan. If Bill Daly wants this, to this, win, this he's is gonna, the old, the old he, ethnic uh, board. And of course, Ed he, Burke is fighting for his political yes, life when uh, he's running for alderman. Right, as well. he's trying to protect himself because he's in a predominantly Latino war. Yes, overwhelmingly. Uh, if, where he's, where he's if, been reelected over oh, and over right, again. Right, right. Yeah. Bill, Bill Daly probably has the biggest challenge because people may be tired of having two Dalys running the city of Chicago. But if Bill Daly were to take the uh, model set up by J.B. Pritzker, and if he does have access to money, he could buy this election if he's willing to spend $50 million. And it just depends. I don't think he has it. I don't I, think he has access to I'm not saying he it. does. No. I'm saying for him not to personally. win, he would have to tap into those financial resources right. where he's at. That would be his biggest shot. If he can't do that, I don't think he's going to be a player. But Michael Sachs, who's also flirting, he's the biggest, one of the biggest fundraisers for the mayor, uh, he's uh, he's sniffing around as well. Yeah, he's trying what to. Would that tell well, you? he's been the the mayor's whisperer, so now he. Wouldn't that tell you that uh, that Rahm Emanuel does not want uh, Bill Daly oh, to replace him? Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you know they've been fighting because yes. uh, Bill Daly is like, okay, you're going to spend your whole time talking about my family, and so you know disparaging my family, and. Uh, but he's only talking about the problem, the bad financial deals. That I the know, but made. but without saying the name. 
<laughs> What's the, uh, is there not, no one has mentioned uh, Paul Vallis. Paul Vallis was one of the first to get into the race. He also has experience. Uh, he has also run for office, not successfully, but uh, just but, to spend a few moments on him and also on Lori Lightfoot, I want to get I your thoughts. I think he'd be on. in that top five that he, we talked about. He might be. I, I think you're going to see a lot of good people in there, but they really have to shine with some ideas. It isn't just enough to have a name to win this mayoral election. With all these people there, there are going to be a lot of people with names, and Paul Vallis, Bill Daly, all of these names, I think it's going to be tough to get over just the name recognition. And right now, I think that's what people identify with Paul. He's a good candidate, smart guy, but what else is he going to do? And, and I always say you have to break campaigns into five-year increments because every five years you have a new group of voters. Uh, so somebody who's 20 today who can vote, you know, five years ago, they were 15, Paul, Paul Vallis wasn't There's on their nothing. radar. So that's how you have to look Daily at this. Daily may not may not Right, exactly. Exactly. Right. But when people start saying, you know, the dailies, they know the dailies only because it was daily, right. daily. And so he, he that's, a, that's a, um, a help and it's a hindrance. And the idea that John Daly may become president of the Cook County Board, I mean, that's another thing that's going right. to hurt Bill mm -hmm. a lot, this idea that, wow, you're going to, if I were running Ex against explain, him. Explain that. Explain that. If Tony I'm Preckwinkle runs for right. mayor. Um, I think it weakens her, and then maybe something happens. Maybe but again, she if, she, if, if Tony Preckwinkle wins the mayor's race, the county board presidency is going to be open. And under, under law, I mean, it's picked by someone who's on the board? Well, but the other thing is, supposedly the way it's set up, the pro tem replaces the president, and the pro tem is Deborah Sims. So why would that not happen? Why would Deborah we Sims? Don't, we don't know. I mean, you know, we know this is Chicago and right. Cook and County, gonna, so yeah. we don't know but how it's going to happen. The situation is if Susanna Mendoza has been reelected, uh, again, if she runs for mayor and is successful, I mean, Governor Pritzker will have an opportunity to replace her. So we have two replacements of uh, certainly the county board presidency is a huge job. But again, that's something else. And by the way, just one back thing, because this is what really has bugged me is, I really do not like the idea when someone is running for one office right. that they announce or even hint that they're running for another office. Uh, and again, that was the case with Susanna Mendoza when it, it, it leaked that one of her campaign commercials was leaked to the media uh, or somehow got out. Uh, and she's running for comptroller. And, and Tony Preckwinkle is running unopposed for a position that she's already announced that she's running for mayor. Should there be something that says you can't do that anymore? Well, you know, the, the problem with that is, is the games people play. I mean, when you wait... Games? To, people play games in politics? <laughs> well, <laughs> when people wait to the last minute to announce that they're not going to run for something, and, and then it throws everything up in the air, I mean, people have to figure out what they're going to do. And somebody who may not have run for re-election for one office, if they had known ahead of time that another office that they really would like to be uh, head um, uh, is going to be vacant, they might not run for re-election. But once they've already committed themselves and then all of a sudden you throw a monkey wrench in yeah. it, they're going to say, hey, I I'm going for it. I don't believe in this idea of term limits. I don't believe in taking away the decision away from the voters. I, I think these are great issues, but I don't think that you impose restrictions. But I think it does hurt them. I think it does hurt them. And we've already seen it come out with uh, Susanna Mendoza when her uh, commercial slipped out. They're using it against her, and that will it, impact her in the election. But it's also the way you go about it. I mean, the one thing Tony did, Tony just came on out and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to run. I think and that's she threw her hat in the ring. Whereas Susanna said, I'm going to be here. She, 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 she nuanced it. I'm going to be here as long as Rauner is the governor. Right. So that was her nuance. That, that, was, so, that was a good nuance. Tony but, Preckwinkle. Other, but, 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 but again, if, if you're Tony Preckwinkle and, and you're trying to, to leverage support for your candidacy for mayor, who's ever being asked to do something, they got to remember if she wins, okay, she's mayor. But if she loses, she's still the county board right, president. Exactly. She's on, so she's got a she's in a very good position for fundraising. She's in exactly. A, she's <laughs> in a power surge, and um, I think that uh, 
that would hurt her running for mayor, but she definitely has the strength, the base. She showed it in the county elections. She pretty much knocked out every person who criticized her soda tax except one guy, Sean Morrison. He survived yeah. barely by yeah. 2,200 votes against a, you know, a, a, a candidate who was a Harvard graduate um, and was Arab American. Um, and it was a very tough race, I thought. But um, Tony Preckwinkle, you have to watch her because she's looks like she's creating her own machine. Oh, it yes. looks like she is the new Richard J. It's Daly not looking of Cook like County. It. <laughs> it is. She is. And I think the only thing that will hurt her is the fact that she is the head of the party. I mean, I've heard- Is she a progressive? I mean, you're a progressive. Once upon a time, she was the darling of the progressives. That was 25 years ago when she was in the city council before she moved up and to bigger office. And she was my client at one time. Okay, well, and, how, and how, how would you, as, as a, looking at her ideology. I recently said in the column that she traditionally has been a progressive, but now she is a boss. <laughs> she wants to be a boss. And so there may be some, you know, pull between the two uh, alter egos. Every boss has a mom. <laughs> do you, Every boss do you comes believe from that uh, the race for mayor is going to have national implications uh, is there any part of the battle that's going on at the, the national party between, uh, let's say, the Hillary wing and, and the Bernie Sanders wing? How is that likely to play out in the in the race for mayor? Are, are people going to are we going to see Bernie Sanders coming in to talk about candidacies? I don't think so. I think that Illinois has defined itself as a strong Democratic state, and I think that they're going to spend less money in Illinois uh, in two years from now than they might have if we had more Republicans in the Congress, more Republicans in Cook County around Chicago. Other than uh, the publicity that she's garnered with Chance the Rapper and uh, uh, in the fundraising that, that she's got and from- Kanye. And Kanye. Yeah. West. Uh, Kanye West. Is there viability, in your opinion, with the Amara Enya candidacy? Is, she, is that gonna go beyond just a couple of great press pops, right? Well, I think she, uh, well, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, well, I, I, I would just say quickly, I think, yes, it can. <laughs> I think she could do very well, and she could end up easily in those top five. She could be one of the top two candidates that ends up, because celebrity and recognition and money, um, I think, are what are going to fuel the, the, the finalists that make it to those two spots. And I was going to say the same thing in terms of being a progressive and also a millennial. So those two things uh, are the most, you know, those are the two most important buzzwords right now out here for Democrats, progressive and millennial. And so if they suddenly get the millennials awake and we saw a little bit of that during this, uh, the midterms the other day. They, they came out. Uh, they were like the third highest group. Um, if they get them out and around her, supporting her, she might have a good chance. The, the question, when you say good chance, you mean a good chance to get into the runoff? Uh, possibly yeah. in the runoff. She okay. could, yeah, she because all she needs is money. And, uh, and if other celebrities are drawn to her and start uh, giving her money, she'll, she'll then attract the yeah. millennials to, who will do the volunteer work yeah. that's needed, the well, boots on the ground. She's very, she's very articulate. Yes. For, for those watching this program, uh, you know that, that, that Amara Enya has been a regular on Beyond the Beltway uh, for the, about the last uh, four or five years. She's extremely articulate. Mm -hmm. and, and again, when, when she announced, or uh, when the first uh, you know, announcement came, uh, you know, I just sent a little note out to all the people that she's been on a panel with, like, like this panel, and everyone, including you know, many conservative Republicans and, and, and fellow Democrats. I mean, it was all positive. I mean, she's a, she's a very positive, mm -hmm. articulate, Everybody, she's a very likable person, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which you can't say about that about a lot of politicians. Right. Getting her Especially out if to you people disagree with her money. politics. I mean, she, they disagree with her politics, but they think, you know, they said, one said, well, you know, she's, she's honest. Oh but, my God, what a thing to say about but, a politician. But that's but, also because of the getting her out there. I mean, she's got some innovative ideas. Yes. I mean, when you talk, when she talked about the pop-up uh, um, rallies, where all of a sudden she just pops up on a street corner and starts talking to people about mm -hmm. issues. Those are, kind, those are the kind of innovative ideas that we need to see. Mm -hmm. By the way, one thing back on the, on the national level that didn't get a lot of coverage the other night, and that was uh, there were also 36 governorships up. 
And governorships are very important, especially uh, two years ahead of a presidential election, because a lot of the machinery, a lot of the political clout in a state goes back to the leader of that state. And so one of the things that I don't think got as much play as perhaps it should, it, it was a very good night. There were 36 governorships up. The Democrats picked up, but they picked up six or seven of them, which was a good pickup for them because the Republicans had controlled 36 of the 50 governorships before last to Tuesday night. But again, in some key races, uh, in key political races as you're putting together your campaign for 2020, thinking of what the president looked at. Well, I'm sure he was, his, 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 his smile was as wide as possible because the, the, when you think of the major political states, it's Iowa, it's New Hampshire, it's South Carolina, and it's Florida, and it's Ohio, and it's also Texas. The governors of all those states are Republicans. And so that is going to mean a lot. First of all, the president put a lot of money into Congressman DeSantis, who, who knocked off Andrew Gillum. But again, uh, that, that's an important piece of, of plotting the, the, the future of the party, because the other states are, are foregoing. I mean, a Democratic governor in Illinois isn't going to mean much you know, to a Republican planning uh, for re-election. Well, what's going to happen in Florida is because of the referendum to allow one million felons to vote next mm -hmm. time, that's going to change the dynamics. Well, the Republicans better start talking about those issues because that's, or that's going to be another constituency group that will, will be lost. I want to spend the, the last couple of minutes is, uh, again, a, a week ago, the national news media was, was talking about the possibility of the first African-American governor of Georgia and the first African-American governor of Florida. Both went down to defeat. And both, the, the polls were, were, were very, very close in each race. Do you think this was another example of the Bradley effect, which is named after Tom Bradley, the African-American mayor of Los Angeles, who when he ran for the governor of California, it looked like he was going to win the race, and a lot of people who said they were going to vote for him in the sanctity, sanctity of the voting booth did not. Is well, that what we saw, well, we or, had our or own were there Tom, other issues We there? had our own Tom Bradley when, in uh, Roland Burris. Uh, yes. Roland Burris tried three times, and he was one of the top state's top vote-getters. He's yes. one of the most popular uh, candidates for comptroller three times, attorney general one yeah. time. So it is very hard for an African-American to become governor. I mean, we've seen that because when you are in charge of the purse strings, completely in charge of the purse strings, it takes on a different, um, people look at it differently. They may like you for this, but they don't like you for that. But the good part of that, uh, good news is those races were close. They were very close. They may not have won, and, and it was a big threshold for them to win. I mean, people wanted them to win, people hoped that they would win, but not winning is not unexpected, but they came so close, and if they run again, they may win. And I think that's what they should take from that, is that, you know what, we're gonna stay in this for the next four years, and we're gonna do this again. As a political operative who everybody respects, mm -hmm. was it a bad idea for Andrew Gillum to have a pre-election party <laughs> with P. Diddy as a, as a part of his party? Was that a good idea well, on the eve of an election I in wouldn't Florida. have a pre-election anything uh, for any of my candidates. If any of my candidates said that, I would kill them. So, I w no, I would never do that. You never count your chickens before they hatch. Ray Hananiel, your thoughts? I, I, you know, I didn't get into all these governor races, but I agree with you. They do kind of set a, a tone and they create a, a base for the presidential election. But the one thing that I did wonder about was, uh, how powerful was Oprah Winfrey in terms of endorsing a candidate, really putting herself out there, really pushing hard, um, and the fact that she didn't win, I think it tells you sometimes that it's better to uh, stay with your bark and not try to bite. I think she was viewed as a very powerful figure who could make presidents and maybe even run for president, and I think in this case, I think she did help you know, her candidate get close, but um, I don't the think public, she did enough. I think the public wants entertainers to entertain well, and not weigh in on political <laughs> issues. And the Democrats, I don't think, will learn that lesson because that's, that's part of their bag is they bring out the celebrities, but the celebrities, they didn't help them in 2020, and I don't think they helped them. Uh, Taylor Swift is, certainly did not help uh, Phil Bredeman in, uh, in Tennessee. So. And I don't think Stacey Abrams needed uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey to help her 
she was already there. Yeah, was she it had the a media lot of grassroots people. But she almost she upstaged seemed to focus her. Yeah, well, upstaged I mean, she her. was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The one last final thing, also, uh, if, if, in looking at governorships, uh, the uh, the New England governorships, the Republican governorships in New England, in, in Connecticut, in Vermont, in Massachusetts, that was another big surprise. So there is a pocket of moderate to liberal Republicans that get elected to uh, high offices uh, uh, in uh, in New England. So. That is our program for this evening. I want to thank Ray Hanania and Delmarie Cobb for joining us for the discussion of campaign 2018. Lots going on. And again, uh, keep tuned here uh, for Ken Davis. He'll have the update every week. He'll be back next week. I'm Bruce Dumont. Thank you for joining us today on Chicago Newsroom.